People, glad you're with us. Welcome to part two of a series that we're doing called um, God and Sexuality um, because, well, you asked for it, right? Uh, reminder, if you haven't already heard, uh, you know, it's, it is a for mature audiences, so this is a great time to get your kid into Mountain Kids, and, uh, but we're, we're just diving in because we, we want to bring every issue, however delicate or difficult, to the scriptures and, and, and be as obedient as we know how to be to what God says. And so that's why we're here. Um, if you want to send in a question that you hope we can get to and address in, in, in the coming week, there's a number on the screen, 94062. You just uh, text your question right there and uh, we'll, we'll take it and uh, we'll do our best. If you want to dig in more deeply, just uh, study more carefully or, you know, more than we have time to do together. We've tried to put together a little resource page. It might help you out and give you a place to start because um, it can be a kind of a mountain of material and overwhelming, so maybe that'll help you if you're interested in doing, uh, doing some of that. So, so yeah, so uh, it's also just a good reminder um, as we dive in that we're... We're going at this issue that's so highly contentious and sensitive um, with that mixture of conviction on the one hand, you know, and, and gracious humility on the other. Uh, conviction coming from the fact that we've done our best to, you know, to study deeply in the scriptures and to carefully think about how it would apply best in our time and in our, in our day. Um, but, but gracious humility meaning uh, to be as much like the love of Jesus as we know how to be. So, gosh, in an area that just, it's so common to just find so much anger and angst about this. We're just not going to have that, you know. We're just going to try to model, in fact, what it looks like to, to do like Jesus did when he came to highly contentious issues, which means to try to be as clear and filled with conviction and maybe even firmness as we know how to be, but always kind and respectful, understanding that, not everybody's going to agree, um, but we're going to lay out what we understand the scriptures to say. So, and I, I just want to thank you for being here. You know, I know it's not easy, maybe for some of you especially, and I want to encourage you to be not just here every week to take in the whole of the, of the thing, but um, to be open, uh, because I really believe that there's something in this area for every single one of us to grow through, um, to be reminded um, that this is what comes from Jesus is always good news, even if it doesn't always feel that way. And if you hear something that doesn't feel to you like good news, I would really urge you and invite you to lean into that and ask yourself why that is when you feel that urge to get angry, upset, lash out, walk out, whatever, to, to ask yourself why you're feeling that way because I, I, I think there's a strong possibility that that is an area that maybe perhaps God wants to say something more to you, okay? Just offer that to you. You're in charge of how you go at this, but that's what I would recommend. We're calling, we're calling this uh, God and sexuality, God and sexuality, because very often, isn't it true, we tend to divide those out. Kind of quick recap of last week. I hope you, if you weren't here, I hope you really do go back and watch that. We tend to keep God and sexuality in separate buckets, you know, like like God is sort of spiritual and sexuality is sort of physical, like oil and vinegar. We, we don't tend to mix them up, but we need to bring them together. And uh, that's what this whole series is attempting to do. And we established last week that we are all, always, sometimes in ways we don't even realize, being shaped, being discipled in our thinking and in our behavior, sexually speaking, because of this massive narrative that is just there all over, the shifting cultural influences and the ideologies that are all around us all the time. We don't even realize the ways we're being culturally kind of shaped and shifted because of the popular thinking around us. And some of that we talked about, it, it includes everything from sex is just a casual toy, uh, sex is, is, is everything. Uh, it includes the hookup culture and, and the ideas that uh, it's for your own gratification that you would pursue sexuality or that if you have any desires, you absolutely must fulfill them or you yourself can't be fulfilled. These are some of the messages that, that come to us. And many more, right? And sometimes we're not very good at even just like, where'd that come from? Because a lot of us assume it's just the way things are. And the Scripture's invitation is to not be squeezed into the world's mold, 
on this or any other issue, but rather to, to try to let our thinking be really renewed and transformed by the ways of God. And so as we dive in to do that, we began by saying it starts with the realization that when it comes to sexuality, there is a divine design, right? That's where we began last week. Like there really is a divine design. What you end up thinking about sex is most likely going to be, termined, be predetermined by what you believe about some of the first verses of the Bible, whether you believe, in fact, God created us with a divine intent. If you don't believe that, then of course you're going to believe whatever you want to believe. But if you do accept on the first page of the Bible that there is a God whose very being is good, who loves you, and who therefore can be trusted to have our best interest at heart, that you would therefore then trust that goodness enough to trust God and obey his words, that's going to radically impact your sexual ethics. And so I cannot emphasize enough how important that first step is. We live in a time when the vast majority of people, it seems, don't accept that there is a God to whom we are um, glad to turn for strength and hope and to whom we are accountable, but rather the inner self becomes the locus of authority for all things. My feelings are my God. If I desire it, it simply must be so, we're told. And if you deny that, then you're going to be in really bad shape, we're told. And when you believe there's a divine design, you're coming under the leadership of God. So as you go through the, the scriptures in Genesis, you know, did you know that when Adam there, he sees the very naked Eve for the first time, he says, whoa, man, which is where we get the word woman. Did you know that? I just totally made that up because we needed something light there. Uh, but the, divi the divine design actually is this, like scriptures like the one that, that says we're created in the image of God, male and female, and that a man would then leave his father and mother. There's a sequence here. There was a differentiation, a maturation that happens where you come into your own maturity and then you can be united and joined to his wife in this holy covenant of marriage between a man and a woman, which is then celebrated and consummated in what the Bible calls one flesh, this beautiful commingling of souls and bodies in this intimate act of sexual intimacy. And we begin to see all through Scripture that sexuality is this beautiful gift, this designed intent that was there before there was sin. But of course, we also noted that whatever God designs... Satan is out to distort and destroy. We experience this every day in virtually every one of God's good gifts that come to us, right? You can count on this. Everything that was given is sort of corrupted and twisted into a place where instead of just being something that brings joy as God intended, it, um, it brings pain and sorrow. This is the result of the fall. So, so, for example, food is a good gift of God right? But now because of sin, we have issues like gluttony and diabetes and purging or obesity. And these are distortions of the good gift that God gave us. Or work. It's a good gift of God. It really is. But now we have, you know, workaholism and a person working so hard that they try to find their identity in their work or ignore their family or their own health, and there's pain and sorrow involved in the good gift of work. There's pain and sorrow in the good gift of rest, which God gave as a gift, but now you can find it being distorted into laziness. And sex is like that. It's a good gift of God's. But practicing sex outside of this divine intent with one woman, one man, and a lifetime covenant relationship of marriage is a distortion of it, we're told, which leads to pain and sorrow. And then the Bible hastens to show us that it's not a picture of a God who's a killjoy, prudish God who's out to ruin our fun, but who wants us to instead enjoy these and all of God's good gifts, who wants us to enjoy the gift of sex more than we tend to, to enjoy life to the full, but who promises that sex in the boundaries is how it is designed to work. And that's why we have these loving warnings from God, which are not unclear or ambiguous, but are sprinkled through Scripture 
the warnings that distorting this gift about what the Bible uses shorthand language like sexual immorality, which is a very unpopular phrase today, right? But when you see that mentioned in Scripture, you can just think of God saying, please don't hurt yourself. I love you so much. Don't stop the chainsaw with your hand. It's like a manufacturer's warning label. So, today, we want to, to talk about some very important things, and I would kind of put them under the heading of desires and decisions. Desires and decisions. Or you could say attractions and actions. Because all of us have had desires um, which have led to decisions or things that have been done to us that are outside of God's divine design, right? We all have. Well, last week we had a real honest hand-raising moment, right, where we all acknowledge that every one of us is sexually broken by things that we've said, thought, done, or had done to us. And, and so I, I, I want to, with that as a foundation, I, I want to take some time here to say some things that need to be said by, by way of an apology, and then secondly, an apologetic, okay? First, an apology, and then an apologetic. The apology is because we have to own up to the fact that the church of Jesus Christ has not always represented its Lord Jesus very well at all times and places in the matter of sexuality. In fact, we have inflicted some damage and dysfunction. So the apologies for some of the ways that Christians and the church of God has been hurtful rather than helpful. And I, I know no one appointed me as the spokesperson, you know, for all Christians everywhere throughout history and all the churches. I'd, I'm not pretending that's my job. But I also know from talking with lots of people about this that when it comes to the subject of sex, there are, there are many people who are stuck they're stuck in their relationship with God. They won't go to church. They're distant from the Lord today because of something that a Christian or a church said or did regarding sexuality. Often, it was something that was not even in alignment with what Jesus would say or do or not in the way, yeah, that he would do it. Way too many people are carrying pain and some kind of bitterness, a wall, if you will, of mistrust. And if you're in the camp where you don't think what I'm about to say or do is important, you think I'm off, I assure you it's not unimportant and I'm not off. So first, the apology. Then an apologetic. So we're apologizing here for some of the ways that Christians, Christianity, the church, in the name of representing Jesus, has actually brought more hurt or confusion or pain as it relates to real people's lives, people for whom Jesus was trying to establish a relationship uh, in, in their life as it relates to sexuality. First, I want to say I'm sorry. When the church has made sexuality and its rules about it more important than a relationship with God, we sometimes imply that what matters most, you know, is external behavior on a thing, you know? copying or complying with all the rules more than even a relationship with God. And there, there's a lot of people who grew up in the church doing their darndest to follow all the rules and they missed out on a relationship with God. Some of us were taught that holiness is mostly about external behavior, like conforming to whatever standard your particular church community had. So some of us, that was like wear your skirt a certain length or, you know, uh, you know don't go to R-rated movies or if you're a guy, you know, look straight ahead when you walk by Victoria's Secret. And those things, you know, those things may be very, very well and good and honorable. But Jesus warned a bunch of people one day. He was talking about some holier than thou's who misunderstood some things. And here's what he said in Matthew 15, 18. He said, you know what? Those people that everybody thinks of as so religious because they keep all the rules, they honor me with their lips. In other words, they followed the rules. They did all the outward behaviors. But then he said what? They're what? Their hearts are far from me. You see, that's one of the dangers that can happen when we talk about sexuality in a way that elevates all these rules. And we try so hard to do that. And people actually miss out on a relationship with Jesus. And it happens all the time. It, happened, it happens all the time. So I'm sorry if the church took a beautiful, wonderful, mysterious gift like sexuality and made it a bunch of do's and don'ts in your mind that kept you scared and away from it. I'm sorry if you believed that God would love you more if you kept all those rules and loves you less because maybe you didn't. 
I'm sorry if the church used guilt and fear and shame to get you to behave outwardly a certain way and somehow you missed the opportunity to truly open your heart of hearts to Jesus to experience actually not just his good boy or good girl for keeping the rules, but his love and grace for you when you didn't. Because that's the gospel. I'm sorry if you came to believe that being a disciple was all about your own discipline rather than your humble dependence on God and his strength and power. Because there's a lot of people who are kind of skating through trying to be pretty good Christians because they, they kept all the sexual rules. And we missed out on the freedom that comes when we fall before Jesus as a sinner and say, I, I need you, I can't do this. Second, I'm sorry if the message you heard was that your value is determined by your sexual history. If the message that was preached and taught kind of just said, you know, your value is tied to your virginity. Because well-meaning people were wanting to uphold maybe the sanctity of marriage, which is a good thing. They wanted to encourage us to save sex for marriage, which is a good thing, but did so in a way that communicated your value or lack of it is tied directly to your sexual history. So if you lost your virginity, you lost your value. If you lost, if you had a sexual past, your life with God was past. You were made to feel like a flower whose petals had already been plucked and you were worthless before God. And if that's the message you got about your impurity, then I'm so sorry. That's not the message of God's heart for any of us. Listen to me. The, the good news of Jesus is that there is more grace in God than there is sin in us. Which means that your worth and your value is not determined by what you do or have done or had done to you. That you're not permanently stained. Your value is determined by what Jesus has done for you on a blood-stained cross and an empty tomb. So I'm sorry. If the church made you to feel like your sexual mistakes somehow doomed your future or your marriage beyond repair, I'm sorry for the young woman or young man who was raped or, or violated and then felt even more shame when you came into a church context because you were no longer a virgin in the way they talked about I'm sorry for the girl who got pregnant but who was told by the church or made to feel that she couldn't come back till after she had the baby because it would make other kids or parents uncomfortable. I'm sorry if you chose an abortion because you didn't feel you could tell your church community about your pregnancy. Weren't sure they could be really trusted to come around you and hold you and that child in supportive environment that would really just help you make a good choice at that point to raise that child together. And I'm sorry if you were led to believe that purity was something you could earn when in fact it's only something that we receive from the free gift of Jesus. Third, I'm sorry if marriage was held up as the ultimate for you, as the end all and be all. As if sometimes I think we are so eager to point out, which is true and good, that marriage is a beautiful design of God's. That we forget it's only one of God's intended statuses for us to have. It's not really for everyone. And that if you're married, you're not less than. If you're not married, you're not less than. Sometimes we've implied that getting married is somehow actually a mark of spiritual maturity, which is nowhere implied in Scripture. And of course, the irony of all this is that the, the most mature, flourishing example of life on this planet we've ever had is, of course, Jesus himself, who was never married and celibate his whole life. The scriptures taught by another single man in 1 Corinthians 7 reminds us that God gives some the gift of singleness for a season, for some, and for a lifetime for the other. So we need to celebrate that marriage is one of God's good gifts, but it's not the ultimate or only gift. So I'm sorry. For those who are told that marriage would save you from loneliness, because I know a lot of married people who are very, very lonely. I'm sorry if you were told that you know, marriage is um, 
you know, the only place for sexual relations and it would automatically then save you from all your sexual frustration. Because I know a lot of people who are married but very sexually frustrated. Or maybe you had this gnawing hole inside of your heart and it just was this sense of deep discontentment and unhappiness and you were led to believe by the way the church talked about marriage that it would fill that hole for you that your spouse would fulfill you, complete you, and essentially be Jesus for you when in fact scripture never says any of that. I'm sorry if we've made an idol, if you will, of marriage, holding it up as if it could do what only Jesus says he can do to be our ultimate lover and bridegroom. As great as marriage is, it's not the ultimate, it's one of God's gifts. And if you're single, I'm really sorry if the church has ever made you feel less than or forgotten or overlooked or like a spare wheel or forgotten in the conversation or the programming. I'm sorry for times that any church might have made you feel like the cure for your loneliness and your discouragement, your discontentment your is going to be you get married because that's the end all instead of leading you to the scriptures which remind us that Jesus alone is our enough. I'm sorry for when the church has said that the only place to have sex is in heterosexual marriage, but then did not also go on to create an environment and a community with deep spiritual friendships where you could actually really belong and have intimate friendships that go deep beyond surface level. We're sorry for anyone who wanted all of that but couldn't find it in your church. A couple more. Fourth, I'm sorry for any time Christians communicated the idea that there are different categories of sexual sin, you know? Like my friend Gene says, have you noticed how Christians tend to get very angry at those who sin differently than they do? <laughs> you ever notice that? It's like we have all these blind spots to our own sin and to people who behave like we do, we're like fine with all that. <laughs> it's just that people who sin differently than we do, we tend to get very self-righteously, very angry about all that. And so I just want you to know I'm sorry if a church ever put you in a circle of shame or judged you because of your sexual sin that seemed different than the others around you. And I'm sorry for the person who went through a divorce and had to do it alone or shunned because the church pushed you out. I'm sorry for the person who came in humility and brokenness to a group of friends or a small group one time to confess having an affair and were met with judgment and disgust. I'm sorry for the one who grew up with same-sex attraction but found themselves bullied by others in the, in, the youth small, in the youth group. So you never really brought your sexuality to Jesus because of the way others talked about it. I'm sorry for the, for the one who got hooked on porn when you were young but you never felt that the church would understand or that it would be a safe place to find help or healing so you've lived in a cycle of shame and bondage for years because you didn't know church could be a safe place of healing. And then I'm sorry if you've ever experienced sexual abuse or mistreatment by a Christian leader. I know I'm talking to some people who have experienced that at the hands of a priest or a pastor or a volunteer leader or some shepherd who broke your trust because instead of caring like the good shepherd would, they, they acted like a wolf or a predator, and I'm so, so terribly sorry for you and for the name of Jesus and for the cause of the church. And we're so sorry for anyone who's attempted to bring your story forward, but you were met with more shame or church leaders who wanted to sweep it under the rug in order to save face. Because we know that people who were mistreated in Jesus' day always found him to care about anyone who was demeaned or belittled in any way. And every church that bears his name to this day must do the same, no matter who the perpetrator may be. I want to extend a special apology, perhaps, to some of our friends who identify as part of the LGBTQ community and their family and their friends and loved ones. I know, thank you for being here and for listening. I know it's 
got to be something that takes a lot of courage to sit through this when you know some of the things that I'm going to say, and we respect you for that. We're glad you're here and want you to hear this. I want to apologize as clearly and sincerely as we can by saying we're sorry. I'm sorry personally for any mistreatment that you have been shown by anyone who has worn the name of Jesus over the years. Last week we saw that um, every person is created in the image of God, and that means every person is an image bearer. And so whenever we demean or mistreat anyone, anyone, any human being, we're demeaning the very God in whose image they're made. We don't often think of it that way because we like to feel justified in being right about something, but it's wrong. It's called sin in the Bible, and we need forgiveness for thinking that being so sure that we're right on a position gives us the right to have a posture of cruelty. I need to acknowledge my own sins in this. When I was young, people would tell gay jokes. I would laugh. When people would use pejorative language about sexual minorities and promoted stereotypes, I didn't think anything of it. And now that I have more friends who are gay and hopefully have grown in my own heart toward Jesus, I realize how much it must grieve Jesus. And so to our LGBTQ friends, I'm truly sorry for that. And I know it has promoted a kind of wedge between a lot of gays and the church. The one thing that everyone of any kind knew in Jesus' days that Jesus loved them. But today on surveys, we learn that the number one thing gays think, Christians think, is that they hate them. So we want to build a bridge, and maybe part of that is just simply saying, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for how Christians have focused on certain verses that maybe were held up and jammed in your face while forgetting what Jesus called the most important verse when he said, love God in Matthew 19, 19, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't put any asterisks on it. He didn't say just love people that you like to love and love people that are like you or don't weird you out. He put no qualifiers. He didn't say love everyone except those who express their sexuality differently than you do. He just said love everyone, whoever they are. And so we want to just say, for any time we've not lived up to the command of our Lord, we're sorry. Love is the orientation of every follower of Jesus. And sometimes we'll say, well, how can I love someone that doesn't agree with me on all these things? It's like, well, if, if anyone who's married knows that you do this every day. Anyone who's ever had any kids? <laughs> I, 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 I live with people who don't agree with me on everything. It doesn't mean I can't love them. I don't agree with myself on half things. So we can fall back a little bit on what Billy Graham used to say. You know, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's God's job to judge. And my job is to love. So if you're a person who identifies as LGBTQ, first you need to hear us say you matter just as you are to God. There's a bloodstained cross in history where God's only son died for you and you matter. It's not like you get your act together and then you might matter to God just as you are right now. The grace of the gospel says just as you are. He's ready. He's waiting. He loves you. He already died for you. You matter. And second, you don't just matter to God, you matter to this church. We're going to do our level best to welcome you here. Even if you disagree with everything else that you hear said in this series about God's design for sex, and if you feel it doesn't affirm something important about you, you still need to know you're loved and you're welcome because this is a place for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. We believe that no matter who we are, or what our story is, the best and most important thing that needs to happen for every one of us is to get connected to Jesus. And so we don't care who that is or what their deal is. That's what needs to happen is to get someone connected to Jesus. That's our, actually our mission. It's why we're here. And so that's why every week the doors are thrown open to all kinds of people from all walks of life, from various sexual histories and experiences and perspectives and orientations every single week because everyone matters to God and you matter to this church. Now, if you want to seek Jesus, that's what we do here. And you want to follow him and get connected to this church, there's something else you should know. And that is, you're in pretty bad company. Okay? 
You really are, because you know what this church is? It's a collection of moral foul-ups. That's who you're looking at right here. We're a bunch of messy failures, and the truth is you're surrounded by people who have a real past. Even this week, we've gone against God's boundaries and blessings and morally fouled up. I mean, some of us have probably succumbed to temptation in just about every single thing this week. You need to understand, if you're going to be part of this community, whoever you are, you're in bad company, okay? You're talking about some people who struggle with greed, who, who, who have demonstrated cruelty in the last 24 hours. These are sins. You're talking about some people who've lost a battle with their anger because the spirit of the dark one took over instead of the spirit of God in their life this week. You're talking about people who have exhibited foul or corrupt speech, which is a sin according to the New Testament, or who have lost battles with alcohol or drugs as they took control of them, or have blind spots of their sin of pride or gluttony that they don't even recognize. You've got to realize you're in pretty bad company. We've got people who are guilty of heterosexual lust and who slip into porn or who've had an affair in their past or, or, or who keep lying about things or stealing and keep coming back to Jesus. If you're okay with that, then you can join in with this bad company. Then you'd be welcome here. You also need to know that we believe the way this whole thing works is that Jesus isn't finished with any one of us that he's working on all of us, and that we are, in fact, being transformed into the likeness of his Son, bit by bit, sanctified, the Bible calls it, made more holy, not by our effort, but by his grace and his strength. We're committed to not being conformed into the world's mold, but to growing and changing and changing and turning and repenting at every point that Jesus calls us to, because we believe that Jesus accepts us just exactly as we are, but loves us way too much to leave us there. And you're invited to that too. In other words, everyone's welcome. But no one's indulged or coddled. We all come to the same Jesus who said, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to lay some things down and die to yourself. We welcome you into that kind of an adventure where all of us dare to be real and honest, not to protect certain parts of my life that are off limits to Jesus, but to say, We're not going to deny our messiness or make excuses for our behaviors, but we're just going to claim the grace and humbly say, I have this that's broken, and I need your forgiveness and healing. And that means there's equal ground at the foot of the cross. And at the foot of the cross, the appropriate posture is not puffing our chest out and saying, take me just as I am, but falling on our faces and saying, I need you, God. And that's a special community that forms at the foot of the cross like that where we all come together, bound together, not because we're pretty good, but because of the one who demonstrated his goodness on that cross and out of an empty tomb invites us into this community. (sighs) Apologies are hard. And I know I did not probably do that perfectly well and uh, the words were probably not right. And I I just hope it landed with the sincerity with which it was intended and that it would help us all better represent the church than has sometimes been the case. But we genuinely are sorry for those things because they have hindered the work of Jesus in us and others. That's the apology. The apologetic. And apologetic is when you you make a defense of the gospel. Like you, you, you say, this is why it is true and makes sense. And so I want to tell you something we're not sorry for. And that is for speaking the truth in love. Whenever you just speak the truth, but there's no love, it's not Jesus' truth. Okay? And whenever you just say, I'm just going to be loving, but there's no truth in it, it's not the love of God. So as followers of Jesus, our source of truth is Jesus himself. Not public opinion polls or the shifting tides of what academics and Hollywood, in academics or Hollywood elites or public polls or educational people say, or the, even the policies of government, they don't determine what we do as Jesus followers. The source of truth is Jesus, and he's the word, and so his written word, the Bible, is our authority as it becomes written on our hearts and woven into our minds, and we dw- dwelling inside of us, it begins to guide our thoughts and actions, and we crave to know how do we live according to God's divine design in this and every other way. Because when you take Jesus, you take all of him, not just the parts that you like, not just his comfort and his assurance, not just his I'll save you, but also his I'll be your Lord parts. 
even the parts that are beyond what we might prefer or desire, where he's calling us to shift and conform according to his will, not ours. And sometimes it's very, very difficult. This whole thing is difficult. I don't, I don't want anyone to be upset with me or angry with me. But I also don't want to stand before Jesus one day and say, you know, thank you for the privilege of being able to speak to this church. But when you upheld those sexual ethics of that, the way you did, and you held fast to what the Old Testament said on marriage, when you said some things about sexual immorality, they were just so out of step with our culture, Jesus, that I just knew it would make so many angry or offended or upset or hurt that we held back. I certainly don't want you to be upset, but I, I also don't want to say that to Jesus. So we're trying to do the grace and truth the best we know how. And I beg you to understand that I absolutely trust and believe that God loves you so much more completely than I or anyone else ever could. That he's just giving us an area, and I, an opportunity to change and to grow and to stretch. So with grace-filled hearts, we're trying to Live out the sexual ethics that you find in the New Testament, in the Bible, in places like Hebrews 13, which says this. It says, honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. Live according to the divine design. God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. And we realize, you know, it's a difficult time to say that. We live in a time when it's like, well, my body, my choice. I mean, how can you possibly say that? My desires are strong and real. We live with all this frame of mind around us. Well, there were some people in the New Testament that lived the same way. They lived in a town called Corinth, which had the, pretty much the same sexual viewpoints that we do today. They all rode around with my body, my choice bumper stickers on the rear end of their camels, and it was all very much a part of the, the air that they were breathing. And Paul hears that a bunch of them begin to follow Jesus. And so they've got all this sexual past and this culture around them, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it and how to bring their God and their sexuality together. And so Paul writes them a letter, and he says to them in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, he says, the best thing to do is flee from all that past. Flee from sexual immorality because it's going to hurt you. All other sins that a person commits are outside the body. But think about it. He says, whoever sins sexually, you actually sin against your own body. And they're like, well, it's my body. Who cares? Why does God care who I sleep with? A question people are asking today. And so what Paul says in verse 19 is, he's, well, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, punchline, if you don't get anything else out of this whole day, catch this word, honor God with your body. So much truth there. The body is part of you. It's not just, you know, that you're a soul with no body. No, your body is part of you. And when God comes to dwell inside of you, he comes to dwell in his Holy Spirit and the Bible says it's like your, your body then becomes that, that, that church building, that temple where, where, where God lives. It's beautiful. And he says, you're not your own, you know. It's not like God made, it's like you made your body, God made your body. And then he purchased it again by giving up his own body on the cross. And then he's going to resurrect your body someday. You know, when we're saved, we're not like, ghosts floating around in heaven somewhere, our bodies get resurrected. The body you have now is part of who you are. Fundamentally, God made your body. Jesus came in a body. He, he gave his body. He was resurrected in a body. And then he's coming one day to judge the living and the dead for the deeds and misdeeds deeds that we've committed in the body. And we will spend an eternity in a created new body. So Paul says it doesn't make sense then that we would then use our bodies in a way that dishonors God because it's not even our body to begin with. And if you say, Jesus, you're my, you're my Savior, you're saying, Jesus, you're my Lord. And so honor God with your bodies. And then let me leave you with this. Just a couple verses earlier, 
He says in chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Any wrongdoers, anyone who's not a wrongdoer, just go ahead and pop your hand up real quick. Jesus wants to know where you're seated, where, where, what you're doing tonight. Yeah, so, so every, everyone's a wrongdoer. This is kind of what his point is. But he's saying there has to be a change in some of our shift. Whatever your desires are, there has to be a decision that changes that. Whatever your attraction may be, that isn't even the issue. The Bible doesn't call attraction, same-sex, heterosexual. It doesn't call that a sin. It says the action that one takes as a result of your attraction, that's where the issue lies. It's not the desire that's the problem. It's the decision to act on it that is. It doesn't matter what your orientation is. And so he says, we've got a lot of wrongdoing going on. He says, but don't be fooled. Don't think it doesn't matter because how we live does matter to God as we either honor God or not. And so he says, neither the sexually immoral, there's that word, nor idolaters, you, know, you put anything in place of God or in front of God, nor adulterers, this includes, according to Jesus, men who look, or women who look lustfully to another person or ever had an impure thought in their heart, nor men who have sex with other men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at that list. And instead of wondering why certain things are on there and why are not on there, the thing to ask yourself is, are you on that list? That's the only thing you need to ask. Any sexually immoral people? Anyone ever viewed any porn? Everyone sent a text you shouldn't have sent? Touched or handled or gone there? How about slanderers? Anyone who's ever shown up without having control of their mouth? Anyone who's not had control of their drinking or has been caught up in a business practice that was a little below the line or cheating or something, you know, you, you, you were committed some injustice to another. That's what's going on here. We're, I'm on that list. And so are you. We're not ready for the kingdom of God as we are. And so there's no room for an us-them mentality or a holier-than-thou. We're all broken and messy in need of grace. And then look what Jesus says to this fledgling church in that radical, sexualized culture like ours. Here's what he says in the next verse. He lists it all, and everyone's like, oh, man, we're all hosed. You know, look at us. We're a bunch of sinners. And then he says this. And some of you were once like that. That's exactly what used to mark and define your identity. You thought that was the most important thing of your life. Remember that? When that was your philosophy, your ideology, when you were conformed to the world, remember that? But then, he says, something changed. You were cleansed. You didn't, you didn't start acting better. You got cleansed and you were made holy. How? By Jesus. You didn't make yourself right with God. You were made right with God by Jesus. How'd you do it? By simply calling out on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And that's how every church is formed. That's how every person comes to faith. That's how every person wins in the end. By admitting who we are and coming before Jesus with all of our past brought to him. Friends, some of you needed to hear this today for lots of different reasons. One of the reasons that some of you needed to hear it is you need to hear right there that you are not your affair. You are not your sexual past. You are not that abortion. You are not your divorce. You are not your porn addiction. You are not your victimization. You are not your orientation. You, that is not your identity. Your sexual immorality is not who you are. We're filled with people who have all that on our list, but such were some of you, the Bible says. Why? Because you can be cleansed, justified, and purified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this church is. And if you want in on that, let's go. Let's pray. God, thank you that we have a community that's not just a bunch of good people trying to get bad people to be good, but that we are broken people calling on your name and who have found salvation and healing and wholeness. And I pray that every single person will be willing to bring their whole life to you on this day. All of it. The broken parts, the hurting parts, the angry parts, the unsure parts. And to fall upon your grace and your truth. And to begin anew. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.